Right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our talk, building an ICS Pi range in our kitchen, uh, sharing our journey and lessons learned so you don't have to. Uh, we have roughly 30 minutes to introduce you to our uh, little project and give you some of the details and um, most importantly also, of course, the challenges and difficulties we had along the way of building a firing range. Um, just wanted to take some time um, before to introduce uh, myself and Moritz um, here next to me and also at Visa the company. Um, starting with myself, my name is Nico. I've been uh, working in the IT security for 15 years. Um, and now I'm the, the penetration testing and red team lead for MVISO in Germany. Hi, my name is Moritz Thomas. Um, I've been with MVISO for over a year now um, and I've been mostly involved in this um, R&D project that we are going to present today, right? A few words about um, MVISO uh, as a company. It was originally founded in, in Belgium in 2013. Um, and then in 2018, we opened the offices in Germany, in Frankfurt and in Munich. And um, currently we're counting over 100 specialized security experts from all areas of IT security, really. Um, and one, one point I wanted to highlight here is, is the, the involvement in research and development projects. So from the annual revenue of the company, we, we invest roughly 10% into R&D projects, uh, which is relevant for this project because it's been partly funded as well uh, by this, um, of course, um, and helped us a lot to develop um, as well and, and try out some things and, and make sure that they work as we, as we wanted them to be. And this is how it all started, was what made us, um, or what motivated us to, to build the ICS firing range um, as it is uh, nowadays. It all started um, towards the end of last year, where we, we did some external trainings on ICS security, OT, OT security, and we realized that there's an abundance of, um, of skills and, and knowledge that we, we need to acquire and also to share internally in the team um, for our pen tester uh, and red teamers. Um, most of them, of course, they come from, from being, coming from the IT world, uh, so they, they don't have any, didn't have any exposure to OT um, environments and ICS systems so far. Um, and as you can imagine, there, there are differences between, um, for example, doing pen testing against IT systems uh, and OT systems were so different requirements um, in, in either case. Uh, so there was a really, really um, a strong requirement for our team to, to get trained in that respect, you know, to develop that, that um, level of awareness um, in, for IT uh, environments. Um, so we, we thought about, you know, what's the best way to do it, um, to maybe develop an, a lab that we can use internally, where we do have a couple of OT components, where people can try out different techniques and just see how they, they, react, uh, how they react in that environment. Um, so that was one of the main reasons and of course having a lab, um, once that is already built, uh, we can use it for research and development where we evaluate specific protocols for example or components, um, but also we can use it for testing itself. So if we, if we engage in ICS uh, security testing, we can maybe isolate OT components and test them in our lab that would be uh, then ready for that purpose. The first uh, concept idea was uh, building a water treatment plant uh, that is comprised of a three-stage water filtration system uh, where water is left with three stages until it is then, um, then cleaned. Um, that, of course, is all driven by pumping stations um, for the various uh, filtration system stages. Um, and in the back, we have a fully virtualized IT network to also simulate the enterprise uh, part um, that you would uh, find in a water treatment plant. This is how it, it first looked like. On the left hand side, you see the, the schema of, of how the filtration would work. So the water runs through all the three stages and then um, ends up in that quality assurance part um, on the right hand side where we do have uh, sensors to measure the quality of the water. And if we determine that the water isn't clean yet, then we would uh, go um, uh, send it back to the, the first filtration stage and, and let it run through it again. Um, we did, for the proof of concepts, uh, we did that with uh, food coloring. Uh, so we had food colored water, send it for the stages, and then in the end it would be clean um, or not, and then it would reiterate uh, through the stages as well. On the right hand side, you see the, the basic setup of the uh, OT components as well uh, that are included in that model. So we do have a PLC, a Siemens PLC that is specifically, but we also have a couple of uh, Raspberry Pis running codices to simulate the PLCs uh, that we might have then addition to drive the pumps, for example, to, for the QA control and so on. And I'm showing you that, that first um, 
prototype of an ICS firing range. I'm just going to show you this video very briefly. Um, once we were in progress of uh, building that lab, I think we were pretty much halfway already. You, you've seen it just in action now. Uh, we were contacted by one of our partners, that's uh, CWD in the Netherlands, and they got to talk to uh, Rijkswaterstaat, which is the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands. Uh, and they, did, they required um, a, uh, a model or a lab environment for their forensics team to, uh, to train uh, their techniques and also you know uh, develop some of the the skills that they need in their field of expertise one of the things they do in the netherlands is operating uh, basket bridges for example so this was a prime example for us um, to to use as a as a model because it's, it's something that um, um, I, th I think um, we can get an idea of, of how it's working it, it's maybe something that can be uh, simulated and it's also very um, very visible uh, then as well uh, their requirement, the strict requirements were um, having a mobile solution because they wanted to move it between sites. And then of course, uh, come with a workshop that is a scenario based. So uh, the basket bridge that we were meant to build then should be, uh, should be used in a way that is versatile enough to run different scenarios for different uh, forensic teams, for example. And this is where the journey began um, of building this bridge. And Moritz is going to run you through the concepts and the, the details of, uh, of how we came to the model that we currently have. So, right. Um, as Nico said, we now changed from um, the, the first context that we had in the first scenario, water treatment plant, to the basket bridge. And it just turns out that this is, of course, part of uh, critical infrastructure. And it's not that easy to get good information about this online. So I would like to give a very short but brief and very nice shout out to the lovely folks over at the Florida Department of Transportation, which were nice enough to make a bridge maintenance reference manual publicly and freely available. Um, and this really contained a lot of useful information. So thanks to those guys. Um, and here you can see our first 2D concept drawing that we came up with, right? So here you can see um, we basically have two sides of a bridge. Um, they both have a leaf and a counterweight and a ground. Um, and on top of the road, we also have some traffic indicators. We have a traffic light um, and we have also road barriers uh, that then should actually block some cars from moving, right? So we had this idea and we then transferred it to a 3D concept. So how were we going to build this? You can see a very brief, a very, very short and simplified um, representation of our 3D concept. So here we got an aluminum frame on wheels, basically. Um, it's divided, divided into two parts. In the front, you have the O2 com OT components mounted onto a steel plate. And in the back, there are some, some black wooden panels now. But in the back, there's space for a virtualization server that we can use to host uh, different networks and different systems on. And on the top there, we have our 3D model of our scenario, those bridges that we transferred from the 2D concept drawing. Well, we had this, but we wanted to build it, right? So we did this using the lovely magic of 3D printing. And due to COVID, we couldn't do this in the office. And uh, we wanted to do quick iterations though. So we had to do this at home. and. Uh, in my kitchen, actually, much to the dismay of my wife, to be honest. It was noisy, it took up a lot of space, but it was worth it, to be honest. It was really cool. Um, so what did we do with that? Um, well, we started working on the mechanical challenges. Here we can see a, an, a very simple axle holder, right? Uh, here we got a bearing that is um, mounted between a clamp, more or less, and that's fixed with some screws. Here are actually two iterations of the same part. And this actually pre pre presented some challenges to us. Um, one of those being, okay, if you want to use screws, um, how big should those holes be? Um, because you don't want the, the screw to just fall out again because it's not tight enough, but you don't want to have the plastic break because it's too tight, right? Um, also, you need to find out, okay, how can we hold other parts with 3D, with, uh, 3D printed parts? So we had to figure this, this out. 
But once we did figure this out and we're satisfied with the results, we can then just proceed with other challenges. So how would we use two of those axles and do, and, and so how would we print two of those axles and connect those to something in between that can actually make use of this axle? So what you can see here is uh, more or less the center part of a bridge leaf. And then we also want to control this, right? So we have to attach some kind of stepper motor to it. And then you have to engineer some gears that you attach to it. And let me tell you, this took quite some iterations, but we kind of got it really, really nice. Um, so, but when you, when you 3D print, you will run into problems. And so did we, of course. Uh, one of our problems was just the infamous spaghetti print. Um, this is just a result of very poor bed adhesion, as we learned. And um, we just solved this by using a mirror as a print bed. And it turns out that this greatly increases um, bed adhesion. Um, another problem was warping. So uh, here a 3D printed part just cooled down mid-print and then it came loose and went places. Uh, it turns out if you make sure that you maintain a steady and constant uh, temperature in the environment, this will probably not happen. So what we did was uh, just get a nice and big enclosure for this for this 3D printer. And uh, we also did some tests with ABS and PLA and found out that if you, especially if you mix between and change between those uh, filaments, that you will run into problems with your nozzles. So just changing them may help um, mitigating the problem of, uh, of, of irregular extrusion of filament. And this was really a problem. Um, but yeah, eventually, eventually we got to a point where we could easily and, 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 uh, and, and steadily print new parts. And here you can see our CAD model of our vision of what the bridge should look like and actually some printed parts of it. So those were very nice wins once we had those and once we could assemble those to a full model. And this actually is, is our full model. But what do you do when you have this full model? Of course, you have to put it all together, right? And that's what we did. So we got this full model, actually we built two and we printed two, which took hours and hours and hours. Um, but then of course we, we had to assemble it into a, into a finished and, and complete and then, and then also usable and mobile um, ICS lab. So what you can see here is our aluminum frame structure with the metal plate for the OCS components um, built onto it. And then of course we installed the OG components onto it with an awful lot of awful wiring, to be honest. Um, then we just installed the 3D models on top of it using some spaces that we printed and designed and bolting those to the, uh, to the wooden plank there. And, you know, just for, for fancy points, we added those panels also that you cannot reach into it during operation, of course, but it looks fancy in my opinion. Um, and of course you need some lighting, right? Because if it's not very, very, very bright inside, then you also want to have some lighting in there so you can actually take a look inside or else it's, it's really gonna get really dark in there. And then, well, lastly, we did a lot of debugging, a lot of software debugging and hardware debugging, and this ate up a lot of time. Um, so really, so if you want to build something, something similar, something like this, just plan ahead of time that you will use a lot of time for debugging. Stuff will break and this will take a lot of time to fix. But let's go into detail about the components that are in there, right? So first of all, maybe most importantly, we got the HMI for the bridge control. Um, this actually represents all the movable and controllable parts of the bridge model on top, right? So for everything like the lights and for the movable parts like the bridge leaf and the barriers, you got individual controls that actually display their current status, color coded text. Um, so that's nice to have. And actually we pre-programmed it so that you can tap onto them and control the whole setup using just the HMI. Of course, this needs to be powered, right? We got power uh, supplies for five volts, 12 volts and 24 volts. These power then are PLCs. Here we got a big S7-1500 PLC that coordinates the other PLCs. Um, we got the S7-1200 PLCs that drive, the, that drive all of the motors and the S7-300 PLC, the legacy PLC that um, controls the lights. And of course, 
Um, an awful lot of the wiring was due to the motor drivers for the leaves and barriers. And if you could see the insides of those cable tunnels, you would be shocked to see how much cable fits into such a small place. Last but not least, uh, we also got some Raspberry Pis for the CCTVs that are mounted on top of the bridge model. Now, having the 3D model printed and all the wiring done already with the OT components, the next uh, step in that process would be the entire, entire IT infrastructure in the back. Um, as you remember, so the idea of, of this lab is also to have it for, um, for workshops, specifically for forensic workshops. So we do need that simulation of an enterprise network, for example, and a Scala network uh, to realistically um, work on, um, on uh, attacks that might have happened against a, uh, a basket bridge to then investigate uh, what, went, uh, what was going on um, in, in that case. Um, so um, on, on that, in that model, um, there is space for a virtualization server. Um, and um, what we did is, is deploy um, uh, this infrastructure on it for that IT infrastructure part, so comprised of the enterprise network where we do have a domain controller. We also have office workstations and a visualization server, which uh, then gets its data from a historian that is running in the Scala network um, in the top of this, uh, this slide here. Um, in, in the Scala network as, as well, we have the operator workstation uh, where we can um, observe and supervise the, the bridge uh, and, and check the status on, of the, the PLCs, for example, uh, but also control it uh, remotely uh, via the HMI. Uh, we get access to the camera feeds of the CCTVs. Um, next to the operator workstation, we do have the engineering workstation where we have a uh, tier, tier, uh, tier portal deployed, um, the, the tool to then uh, deploy the ladder logic to the PLCs. Um, but also maintain the, the OT uh, components um, as such. Um, from there on, um, we, uh, connected, we are connected to the lower levels of the, the bridge infrastructure, so this is not uh, virtualized anymore. That is where we actually have connected the, the PLCs um, with the uh, centralized PLC in the area supervision control um, level. Um, including the, the HMI that you did see on the screens before for the manual but also automatic control of the bridge components. We do have the CCTVs which are essentially just Pi cams uh, connected to the Raspberry Pis uh, of that model. Um, and then on the lower levels we have the three, the three different PLCs to control the barriers but also the leaf uh, motors um, to get the to change the lights uh, from green to red um, and so on. This entire um, IT and OT infrastructure uh, then serves as the basis for a scenario that we carry out in preparation for a, for example, for a forensics workshop. Um, the idea was really that we, we go through all the levels of the purge model um, to simulate an attack as it would uh, most likely be in a real life scenario. So you can assume that, for example, a workstation in the enterprise zone is compromised uh, through an email uh, where then the attackers uh, de deploy beacons that communicate to a C2 server uh, somewhere outside. Then um, at some point the, the attackers, um, uh, once they, they got that initial photo, they, they, they escalate the local privileges, um, do some credential harvesting to finally then get access to the SCADA network where we do find the operator's workstation, but also the engineer workstation with the tier portal on it. Um, assuming that maybe it's not fully patched, uh, that could be one of the scenarios, uh, then we can exploit some vulnerabilities against the engineering workstation, gain access to it, gain also access to the leather logic, we can then deploy um, any arbitrary uh, code really on the PLCs that might cause um, some disruption to the, the bridge operation, but also maybe uh, severe harm to actually the, the people using the bridge. So um, just imagine that um, if cars are driving over the bridge, you, you slowly uh, lift the leaves. Uh, so there might be accidents happening then in, in that case. That's the, um, that's the scenario idea of, of our ICS firing lab. So really, um, that's an attack that already took place and then in the next step the forensics team would get their hands on the lab and would need to investigate what happened there. And um, so much talking, uh, now we're going to show you the, the lab now um, in a demo, so the, the real lab that we actually built and uh, just give you a few ideas on what's going on there. This is the complete 3D model now with all the OT components connected. You do see, once it's powering on, uh, you see the, the HMI uh, turning on, you see the, the PLCs already blinking, um, they're also booting up. Uh, they're all connected uh, by Ethernet together, so they um, also with a, with a server in the, in the, behind the, uh, the steep plate that you see there. 
Now we should see uh, the HMI UI also being displayed in a second. There it is. And this is now where the bridge automatically starts into its cycle. So that is just uh, set up for demo purposes right now. We just cycle through the entire process every 30 seconds, starting with the leaves uh, lifting um, and then the, the lights going on for the, the ships and boats to pass through the bridge. Uh, you can see in the, in the HMI on the left hand side uh, that this is now green. So that means the leaves are open, the traffic lights are green so the ships can pass. And um, soon the, the lights will go red again, the leaves lower. And uh, once they have done that, um, and in a second we'll see the barriers go up. Just any second now, there the, the barriers are going up. You can't see the lights for the cars, unfortunately, but you can see it in HMI that they switched green as well. Um, and now the, the cars can drive. This is the automatic mode. You can at any time um, go into the, the manual mode. Uh, and then operate any of those components manually really. So you can just lift one of the leaves uh, or the other one and then the barriers um, in whatever sequence you, you like. So let's get to the lessons learned because there were quite some few lessons to be learned, to be honest. Well, let's start with the ICS lab setup. Um, to be honest, designing the stuff yourself, you have to account for the assembly of how you're going to reach parts of how you're going to um, to connect them, uh, how to uh, put them into place. We didn't really take this into account and then had some, some problems, some issues with um, really complex assembly. It just took a lot of time. Maintenance was hell. Don't do this. Um, think of this um, ahead of time. This really pays. This is really good. Um, during research, of course, we had to find out then um, which hardware um, has which dependencies and which uh, compatibilities. This really required a lot of digging through data sheets. Uh, you have to acquire those, you have to read those, you have to understand those. You know, if you're not an expert, and we have by no means uh, uh, experts in, in this field, uh, this will take you time and take this into account too. Um, and of course, if you want to use industrial hardware, you will have to pay for licenses, right? Um, especially the, the IDEs, they come with, with heavy licenses. Um, and a practical issue just was that we uh, managed to kill two stepper motors by overheating. We supplied too many amps and um, did not really get rid of all the heat. We didn't manage to dissipate it all and they just died on us. And um, this, this was really, really bad uh, because then you have to order new ones and you have to install those again. And, you know, as I said, the, the assembly was not really straightforward. So this just took a lot of time, it was unnecessary, but hey, this happens. Uh, regarding 3D printing, well, as I point, pointed out earlier, um, there will be mechanical design that will be challenging. If you're not a mechanical engineer, and again, by no means we are, we are <laughs> mechanical engineers, right? Um, what you saw in our setup was not very, very, very complex. I mean, it was just an axle, right? And, and two gears that drove this axle. You have no idea how long it took to just build this and to test this out until it just worked. So if you're not very familiar with it, again, uh, think of it ahead of time. Um, also, if you want to iterate quickly, you have to take into account that printing is really time consuming. Uh, overall, just one side of those bridges took multiple hundreds of hours to print, like they were about 200 hours to print, just one side. So the whole setup was about 400 hours of printing time. So this is insane for quick iterations. Well, print small parts and test them, right? Um, also, if you're not familiar with CAD yet, well, um, I suggest you will, because this is really the preferred choice. Uh, you can parameterize everything um, and you can make quick but very uh, consistent changes to your designs. You can just um, iterate better with this. Um, in my opinion, it's better suited than, uh, let's say, creative software like um, Blender for 3D modeling, because this will give you other problems, right? Um, and to, to, to add some numbers, to our, uh, to our project. Well, we started in January 2020 and we invested more than 1000 hours of manual work into this and more than 900 hours of printing time into this. Well, I just said we, uh, it took about 400 hours of, of printing all the components that make up our bridge scenario, right? Well, of course we had to do a lot of prototyping. I have a, a, a huge box of, of failed prints or prototyping prints uh, still in my kitchen laying around there taking up space again. But anyways, um, we also um, 
and processed about 15 pounds of filament. So take this into account. Um, as I said, the software licenses are kind of pricey. Well, they are. Uh, we use the TIA portal first for the Siemens POCs, which costs us in total 3,500 US dollars. Um, all the hardware combined cost roughly, well, 14K US dollars. And you know, for all the, the coffee that we that we just uh, consumed during this this project, it was roughly about 570 US dollars. I know it's only specific, but it's just a rough estimate, right? Um, and then of course we broke stuff. Uh, as I said, we broke two stepper motors. Uh, we actually managed to break one PLC and today, just until today, I'm not quite sure how I managed to do this, but this happened. Um, after I replaced it, everything was okay. So I think that's nice. Um, one motor driver died in the process due to um, wrong wiring, but hey, that happens. And of course, at, at several occasions, we just lost our sanity on the line, right? So if you're going to go into such projects and work on those and you are not that familiar with all the technical aspects, well, uh, you will have problems and you will pay with your sanity. Okay. I hope that you got a good idea of, of what we had to go through in the past uh, six or seven months. Um, and I hope that you found this interesting and maybe there's something for you as well to, to take away from it. Um, in any way, if you are interested in, in this project specifically or if you are working on a similar project and just, you know, do some follow-up questions, uh, feel free to reach out to, to other uh, modes or myself anytime. Um, also, I wanted to, to point you uh, at the uh, invisible contribution to ICS security, so we do have that, uh, that ICS uh, page there, please um, have a look at it. Um, and maybe there's something also for you there. Um, and again, reach out to us uh, if, if there's more uh, you want to know about. And last but not least, um, we do have a couple of blog posts coming out um, for this uh, ICS firing range. Um, so we, we want to go more into detail of, uh, of how the development went, uh, show some of the close-ups, maybe some of the schematics and, and how the wiring works. Uh, more specifically how the attack scenario that we envisioned um, comes together in, in that lab and also um, with mo some more detail describe the, the actual uh, difficulties uh, we had just uh, for able to see and share with the community as well. Um, thanks very much for joining and um, have a great day.